As the world enters a new era, a new chapter of tourism has begun. Thailand presents amazing new chapters. Thailand has it all from A to Z. Awaken your senses. Start a new chapter to awaken your senses and feel more alive. Beyond expectation. Start new experiences that go beyond every expectation. Craft your imagination. Start new excitement that inspires anywhere, anytime. New expressions of romance. Start a new chapter in life, more romantic than words can describe. Overjoyed with excitement, start a joyful new day where your heart beats to the new rhythms. Pump your heart with flames of passion. Start a new memory that ignites flames of unforgettable passion. Reconnect with nature. Start a new rhythm that reconnects and refreshes your soul with nature. Submerge yourself in local culture. Start new laughter that echoes loudly through local community-based tourism. Experience new chapters of Thailand. Visit Thailand Year 2022. Amazing new chapters. Amazing Thailand. Szukasz atrakcyjnych terenów inwestycyjnych? Potrzebujesz działki dla swojej firmy? W Toruniu mamy to, czego szukasz. Blisko 40 hektarów dla biznesu w strefie inwestycyjno-logistycznej. Tereny pod usługi, produkcję, składy i magazyny. Połączenie z autostradą A1. Uzbrojenie i drogi dojazdowe. Działki dla małych i średnich przedsiębiorstw od 2000 m2. Tereny dla inwestorów nawet do 4 hektarów. Toruń. Przyjedź, zobacz. Zainwestuj! Dear colleagues, uh, welcome cordially at the panel, which I have the pleasure to chair. The topic of the panel is uh, political strategies in contemporary Asia. I can see Professor uh, Serda Ahondova. Uh, so maybe she will join us later. And now I would like to ask to deliver her speech, um, Dr. Paulina Janik from University of Warsaw. The topic of uh, the speech is 1918-1919, Ashgabat to Ahmednagar with British Indian Army. Um, the floor is yours, welcome. Yes. Thank you very much for that and apologies for messing up uh, the schedule of today. Unfortunately, I have to go back to work and I can't stay with you um, until um, until 1 p.m. So apologies for that. I hope you'll find the topic interesting, even though it is more uh, of a literary uh, studies analysis rather than um, anything to do with the, with political studies. Uh, so let me just uh, show you a presentation just so you have something more interesting to look at. Okay. Uh, okay, and since I'll be referring to, uh, to this article briefly as well, if you'll be interested in uh, looking into that, um, I have got a, some free copies as well, so if you'll be interested in, uh, in looking into that, uh, then I may copy it into the chat box, uh, actually I may do that now as well. Uh, there you go. So if you are interested in, uh, in looking into uh, the article I'll be referring to in a moment, uh, please feel free to, um, to enter. Now let me just show you the presentation and uh, we can start. Um, right, so my name is Paulina Stanik and I have uh, Oh, somebody has the mic on. <laughs> 
Um, and I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, Faculty of Modern Languages uh, University of Warsaw. And uh, this presentation is a follow up on the article published uh, earlier uh, last uh, year in the first uh, World War uh, Studies Journal. It focused on the case of some 30 Poles stranded in India after uh, the First World War. Uh, the two names that stood up among them were that of Henry Gewaszynski and Mieczysław Schmidt. Um, they both authored memoirs uh, that are a rare source of knowledge um, on Polish early 20th century non European internments. And while the protagonist of uh, the article uh, you have got uh, access to uh, through the chat box uh, was Henry Gewaszynski. Today I'm going to look uh, into more, in more detail into uh, Schmidt's memoir entitled On His Majesty's Service Now Go Up and Stano. No. Um, and that, uh, that memoir describes the author's journey uh, from Central Asia to India together with the soldiers of the British uh, British Indian uh, Army. Uh, basically, my research focuses on uh, British Indian Army in general, uh, especially during the period uh, of the Second World War. Uh, that's an exceptional piece of research because I'm not normally focused on the First World War, but I found uh, this topic very interesting and I thought I would work on that as well. Um, so his memoir paints a picture of the given periods as abandoned in cross-cultural uh, encounters in foreign and familiar lives in spite of, uh, in spite of being a distressing account of one's trauma of at the same time, um, while being under constant surveillance by British uh, Indian Army officers and the Indian troops, the author had a chance to reflect on his self opposite the South Asian other, of course, and confront uh, stereotypes that is the period of the First World War, actually uh, at the end of the First World War. Before I move on to, um, to the analysis, uh, let me quickly guide you through the presentation. There will be a brief introduction, then I'll move on to uh, the author and his memoir, then um, I'll move on to the arrest and the journey itself and the representation of the Indian uh, soldiers in, uh, in, in his memoir before uh, before concluding. Um, so uh, the author himself, although the exact date um, of the author is, uh, date of birth of the author is not known in the early 1880s, he was a student at back then uh, Imperial University of Warsaw, uh, today's uh, Warsaw University. And he, during his uh, university years, uh, he was an active member of the student community, took part in demonstrations against uh, intensifying classification processes. Um, he spoke fluent English, uh, fluent French, but no English. And uh, for that reason, he had to rely on his companion's translation skills uh, for information during his journey to India. Um, he does not discuss his world participation in the memoirs. Um, but he claims to have lived in uh, in Baku uh, for about 25 years before uh, 1918. In the interwar period, he uh, published uh, four books, two memoirs dealing with the experience of the internments, a record of his participation in the university process, um, and um, a commentary on the post-war political condition on, of, uh, of Poland with the focus on uh, its place in the new world order. After the return to Poland, he lived in Warsaw and in Kielce, he worked in local administration office. Um, and um, unfortunately, he uh, suffered from poor health and uh, poverty after uh, his return to, uh, to Poland in uh, in the early 1920s. Um, he was arrested while on a business trip from Baku to Ashgabat in uh, 1918. Uh, in his memoir, he portrayed himself as an innocent victim of British imperialism and circumstances, for he insisted he never learned the reasons why he was arrested. Um, it turned out um, that he became entangled basically in a um, uh, brief episode of um, British military involvement in uh, back then Transcaspia, also called the, uh, the Malice of Mission. Not much is known about uh, that uh, British military engagement, but for um, for you interested in uh, Central Asia, perhaps uh, you're more familiar with that. Um, apparently, he had been denounced as an anti-British spy by the hotel uh, owner. Mm. The British claim that prisoners were in uh, possession of German propaganda materials, including copies uh, of this uh, propaganda uh, poster. Yet, since the decision making was not a straightforward process during the mission, it remains unclear who was responsible for his arrest. And we don't know that, um, even though I looked into uh, archival materials, uh, national archives in, uh, in London, in the British Library in, in London. In, didn't manage to figure out exactly what happened. Um, so that's still an interesting story and a lot to uncover. So what happened next after a brief, brief period of incarceration is Ashgabat, he was sent um, by train to the Persian border where he was intercepted by Indian soldiers. Um, then he traveled to Masha Kutitan and Forsyth. There uh, they were confined in tents in the courtyard because there was no permanent prison in the city. 
Mm, and uh, there was another officer named Olof uh, Holmschmidt uh, accused of dehumanizing treatments uh, later on. Next, they were escorted to CAF by Lieutenant Thompson, so another British officer was in charge of them. After several days, they departed uh, again uh, farther south, heading for uh, Rabatsak. And that they were taken over by another British lieutenant uh, named Allen. In the early days of November, the internees reached Keta, uh, where they boarded a train bound for uh, New Delhi. He was to spend eight months in total in India. After, uh, after having reached the Indian city by train in November 1918, he was first taken to an internment camp in Nogang and then to um, Ahmed Nagar. He was released uh, on April uh, 17, 1990, and sent to uh, Bombay, where he boarded uh, a ship. Uh, heading to uh, Vladivostok. Then in Vladivostok, unfortunately, he was not free to do anything he wanted. He was arrested by the Russian authorities who kept him in prison for some time. When they finally released him, um, he did not have um, financial means to return to Poland. Uh, so he was forced to stay in uh, Vladivostok working, uh, hoping to get enough money for the ticket home. Um, he managed to, um, to return only in 1922 to, uh, to Poland. His initial attempts to claim compensation from the British government, uh, he submitted to the British legation in Warsaw. Unfortunately, it was uh, it was ignored. Um, he decided to publish a memoir just so everybody knew uh, what happened to him and that the British were responsible uh, for that. So he chose to include precise details, dates, names, places um, of people he uh, he met there, um, because he wanted his memoir to serve as a report as well. Uh, he was awarded awarded one thousand pounds six years later when. A British MP approached the British government on his behalf. So, uh, so what you can see here uh, is a photograph taken um, at the British uh, Library uh, archives uh, re related to uh, to the case. So, in the end, he managed, but uh, he spent many years trying uh, getting that compensation. Um, he, I don't think this is important, so I can move on to. Uh, something more interesting perhaps that is the analysis of the, um, the representation of the Indians in, in, in his memoir. Um, so in the late uh, 19, uh, 19 and early of 20th century, uh, the subcontinent was one of the places that Europeans had heard of, but neither visited nor fully understood. Uh, and then the imaginary geography of Indian people was what the author too based his uh, presuppositions on. And once upon hearing Indian gas coughing violently, he remembered that um, the delicate body of the Indians, accustomed to the microclimate of India, does not adjust well to the climates of foreign countries. Most people going beyond its borders are doomed to tuberculosis and death. Um, similarly, he believed that uh, the Indian soldiers could never invade Moscow, for they were each fitted for the harsh uh, Russian wind of this uh, climatic element. Um, by creating a link between one's physicality and the place of origin, Schmidt confirms that author imagined these geographies had real consequences for people's actions that were important to people's understanding of what they saw and experienced in, uh, in their travel. Um, in light of archival documents, uh, the Indian soldiers who escorted the group of prisoners arrested in Ashkabat were part of the 28th light cavalry in Persia, and I managed to find some nice images. So you can see there was also Captain Olof, uh, whom I mentioned and whom the, the author did not really like. Um, and the 19th uh, Punjabis, the author did not know the names of the units. So uh, so um, luckily I managed to find it uh, in other ways. Um, his first encounter with the Indians took place at a train station in the village of Arctic and was a sort of excitement for two reasons. Firstly, the author believed he was finally safe from the hands of the British. And secondly, the soldiers in their uniforms looks, uh, looked picturesque. Um, and that's how he described them. That's one of the soldiers of the 28th Light, uh, light Cavalry. So this must be something uh, similar to Schmidt. Um, so at that time, um, his fascination with uh, cavalry might have stemmed not only from the European discourses on war and masculinity, but also um, from the changing social and historical condition of the country. Uh, the military struggles over the partitions reinforced the ethos of a soldier and the romantic cult of heroes. If you want to go deeper into that, uh, that began with the uh, celebration of Napoleon Bonaparte, of course. And the Poles believed uh, that he would help them regain independence, and that had been lost in 1795. And the Polish legions, of course, uh, in, uh, military formations serving with the French army, were to become permanently associated with the um, figure of a Polish lancer. So, um, could be uh, the reason why. Uh, Schmidt pays so much, so much attention uh, to that. I did uh, some uh, additional research uh, on that, not as a part of that study, but um, 
as a part of another study. So um, I have some reasons to believe that um, he was inspired uh, by uh, by those images in uh, in his comments on um, Indian cabaret. Um, then, um, despite their elegance, however, he noted uh, some sadness in their eyes, and their meaning uh, Indian soldiers, uh, he linked that to the political situation of India. As far as uh, the face is concerned, apart from describing penetrating eyes of the Indian soldiers, he frequently refers to them as men with brown faces, uh, involuntarily pointing to a taxonomy of difference. Skin color was an indisputable source of privilege and source of power in the colonies. For Schmidt, ordinary Indians also um, re resembled huge chocolate dolls in a European shop, uh, shop exhibition. That's very, an interesting uh, comparison. In, um, by doing this, he points to the existence of prejudices, uh, of course, stemming from skin color and the nice indigenous people, the voice and unconstrained presence in the early 20th century. Russian di uh, racial differences reflected people's civilization and the cultural attributes, and even identified different sections of people as interestedly or biologically suited for particular tasks. And here I point to the martial race discourse um, that contributed to the preservation of, um, of the British Indian Army. Um, yes, and I guess this is not important as well. Um, so yes, moving on, uh, the next uh, excerpt we can see here, um, I should be getting to that as well. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, the polls observing, I paid much attention to the relations between the officers and their men. He noted that the Indians felt uncomfortable in European style uniforms. Uh, they wore them out of necessity only when performing duties, otherwise they preferred the traditional more loose clothing. Having realized that the guards had to put on their uniforms before taking the internees uh, to the latrines, he felt responsible for adding to the discomfort despite his own hardship. On another occasion, when a soldier was instructed by his British officer to hold one end of a rope while the arrestees were asleep. The author called it a medieval practice and mocked the British organization of labor. Mm, again, he felt sorry for the man uh, who Captain Olaf um, ordered to spend the night with the rope in his hands. Uh, it was uh, totally unnecessary, he, uh, he said. The soldierly skills of the Indians did not escape uh, Schmidt's scrutiny either. Overall, he portrayed his escort men as going above and beyond the call of duty in obeying orders. Sometimes they were more brutal, controlling or shortening than they could have been. For instance, uh, once he was be, you know, beaten with a cane stick for attempting to use a shortcut uh, while walking. Um, and he complained about having his hands always tied when it was not necessary. Mm. He became skeptical uh, later on towards the abilities of the colonial soldiers. Uh, later during the journey, he witnessed how the Indians forgot to load their rifles. Um, and he also learned that some men fell asleep on duty. And also this is the reason why um, he believed that an uh, Indian army could not really fight uh, the, the, the European enemy. Uh, because they did not have um, the endurance and physical partners. This is with the, the, the court you can see as well. So, um, so basically, to cut the story short, he believed that the Indians were incapable of facing European enemy. Um, firstly, because um, of, the, um, of the climate where they came from, and uh, secondly, uh, because uh, he was skeptical towards uh, soldiers who um, fought not for their own uh, cause, but fought in a foreign army, uh, which he uh, which he called the British Army at uh, that stage. Um, and basically, I'll be heading towards the conclusion. Yes, although conversing with the uh, with the guards was also forbidden, the internees uh, who knew languages managed to communicate with the Indians on several occasions. Schmidt could do that himself. Um, he, could, he couldn't, sorry, do that himself because he did not speak English, yet he noted that whenever the soldiers spoke, they expressed themselves in, quote, broken English, unquote. Um, so he did not uh, speak English, but he uh, commented on the Indian uh, soldiers' English. In most cases, uh, conversations of good when the British were not present in regard to the origin of the internees. On one occasion, uh, he introduced himself as an engineer and he was asked by some Indian soldiers uh, to help uh, fix their wristwatches. His ability to fix the devices helped improve the relationship between the guards and the prisoners. 
Mm, throughout the narrative, uh, there are a few moments of relaxation. Once uh, after a dangerous journey across the mountains, the Indians invited the internees to sit by the fire. The atmosphere was friendly. Um, and the man shared food and cigarettes. Acts of kindness during his journey were so uncommon that the author felt particularly attached to the material proofs of it. He kept a blanket given to him by uh, Captain Forsyth and a tobacco pouch he received in secrecy from an Indian soldiers. Mm. The man who threw it to him during a journey um, also shared a cup with him. Um, you can see it, uh, it's a part of the memoir as well. So uh, Schmidt was uh, so, uh, so concerned about uh, this material proof of kindness uh, to, uh, to Indian soldiers that he even incorporated a picture of that into, uh, into his printed uh, memoir. Um, and that would be the end uh, of the presentation. So to conclude, the author's unexpected journey in uh, late 1980 changed a relatively peaceful wartime, which he spent in Baku, um, into a nightmare that took toll on the elderly man's uh, mental and physical health. Uh, if I remember that right, I think he was about when he was captured. Um, and the fact that he committed his interwar years to writing indicates uh, the trauma that made uh, him fear for his country's future overshadowed by great European uh, empires. Since people do not see the world in the center of the cultural baggage of their bringing, Schmidt could not be detached from the peculiar way the Poles viewed the world at that time. He saw India as an oppressed nation and a victim of British imperialism. In his view, the soldiers of the British Indian Army were um, or experience perhaps double oppression uh, because uh, firstly they were uh, subjected um, to harsh military discipline and on top of that of course British imperialism. Although Schmidt's representation of the Indian soldiers is not free from the Euro Eurocentric bias, it is a valuable source of knowledge about Polish early 20th century perception of that distant culture since the author could have tangled in British imperialism, uh, imperial politics, he could observe its aftermath and re reflect on his position in the colonial discourse. He placed himself in the position of uh, civilizational superiority when, for instance, he looked down at the guards and mocked their lack of military uh, skills and manners. At the same time, he seemed fascinated by the elegance of the cavalrymen. Um, that could have stemmed from the Polish admiration for uh, the Polish Frances and uh, the romantic Polish romantic tradition. Yes, and I guess uh, I could finish uh, at this stage. Thank you very much uh, for bearing with me. Thank you very much for the presentation. And as I know that uh, Mrs. Kanik uh, will not be able to stay with us till the end of the panel, I suggest we have a short uh, five minute uh, uh, questions and answers session. So please, uh, I invite you to ask questions to this speech. Uh, I cannot see the question, so I have uh, one brief. Uh, what were the sources of your material? Uh, in what countries, in what libraries, uh, if you look for the materials you based your speech on? Um, so uh, I got inspired by the memoirs, uh, memoir, memoir itself, actually, the first one. And uh, you, you can find it online. It has been uh, digitalized. I'm not exactly sure what is uh, what is the website. I think it's um, the Pioneer Place, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so if you just type in uh, the title and the author, you'll be able to, uh, to find it for sure. And then there are also in other libraries, digital libraries, you can also find uh, the, all the other books because he has published four. So uh, so it's very easy to look into them if, if you are interested. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, because war memoirs in general, memoirs in general, self-biographical writing, you can really take everything what's in there for granted. Uh, I had to supplement it with uh, archival materials that shed some more light on that. Um, yeah, so basically the memoir was uh, was what I got inspired um, by, and then uh, of course uh, some archival material that I find in uh, accidentally actually uh, in the British uh, in the British Library archives in uh, in London. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Okay, if not, I can see uh, Professor Sveta Hundavellen, and because we replaced these speeches, please let me uh, to, uh, I will try to stick to the program, 
and please let me to tell you briefly what I have prepared for today. The topic of my paper is Iranian leaders and the Western world problems, role, strategies, solutions, selected aspects. I will wait with my questions <laughs> and answers till the end of this session. So uh, I'm starting and of course I will watch my time. Uh, introduction. The Islamic Revolution of 1979 was an event that brought about the radical definition of the relationship between religion and modernization. The slogans proclaimed at that time mobilized the nation to mass protests and gathered it around the figure of the supreme leader, then Ayatollah Musavi Khomeini. In 1989, Khomeini died, indicating his successor, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. In this way, he secured the ideological continuity of the Islamic Republic of Iran based on the ideals of the Islamic Revolution. The interpretive scheme of the world created in 1979 and strengthened over the years gave Iranians a sense of community. It was based on a black and white division into the good and the evil. The former is associated with broadly understood justice, while the latter with oppression. In the real world, the power of evil represents the Western world, with the United States at the forefront, while the Islamic Republic of Iran is perceived as the guardian of the good, fighting for victory over the evil. It is worth of mentioning that the narrative prepared and reproduced in this way provides tools for interpreting contemporary events, especially for poorly educated people with low level of political culture. It also provides answers to questions about the ways of action and their ultimate goals. On a psychological level, therefore, it secures basic needs, order being protected and having direction. As long as Iran's political elite meets these needs, the public is not determined enough to seek out other leaders. As for security itself and its definition, it is not without reason that I refer here to a psychological mechanism that is strongly coupled with cultural conditions. Gildhofstede called culture the collective programming of minds. Iranian society have been, has been programmed into the values developed as a result of the Islamic revolution, and even if it consciously contests them, criticizes the way Shiite clergymen govern and shows for reaching anti-Islamism in service, at the level of cultural programming, it remains in the space of binary division of the world. The sense of security in this case is not conditioned by the economic security, but it has its source in having a coherent picture of the world and tools for interpreting the events. I put forward two hypotheses. The first one says that Iran's reaction to the war in Ukraine must be considered in a broader perspective created by key events such as the nuclear agreement and strategic goals conditioned by the ideolo ideological foundation. And the second hypothesis is that the armed conflict in Ukraine is framed into a broad interpretative scheme of the struggle between the East and the West. It occurs in two versions. One version is presented on the International Forum and its framework is formed by NATO's effort to expand its influence and counteract Russia's expansion. In this case, the tone of Iranian politicians' statements is balanced and factual, and the choice of words is neutral. The framework of the second approach is formed by the ideals of Islam, above all the fight against oppression, arrogance, and ignorance, on the one hand, and the anti-values of the Western world, such as exploitation, causing crises, falsehood, on the other hand. It is presented to the Iranian society, and in this case, the statements of Iranian politicians have a very emotional overtone. They are rich in pejorative words. Uh, Ukraine, in the speeches of Iranian politicians, uh, it can be said that Ukraine as a thematic threat first appeared in the statements of Ayatollah Khamenei uh, in uh, 2000 sword. In his speech to members of the Iranian parliament, he referred to Gorbachev's reforms. He considered them as a consequence of the actions of the United States 
which, in the opinion of the Ayatollah, by pretending to carry out reforms and promote the modernization of countries, are gradually taking control over the countries and destroying their stability. At the same time, he pointed to a certain mechanism noticeable in his opinion also in relation to Iran. And here I quote, I came to the conclusion that the United States has developed a comprehensive plan to overthrow the, overthrow the Islamic system. This plan is an imitation of the plan that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. The US officials intend to carry out the same plan in Iran and there is enough indication in their selfish and often hasty remarks made over the past five years that they intend to do so. Khamenei analyzes in detail the events that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union and concludes, soon after the republics of the Soviet Union began to claim independence one by one. For example, Ukraine said it wants independence. The theme of Ukraine once again appears in the statements uh, of the Supreme Leader in 215 at the meeting with the commanders of the Iranian Armed Force. In both of the above examples, uh, it is of marginal importance and serves to exemplify phenomena concerning the situation of the Islamic Republic of Iran itself, rather than to be a factual assessment of the international situation. The assessment of contemporary events looks different. The tone of the speeches does not change when it comes to assigning the West's intentions and NATO's motivations. The leader says, quotation, if the oppression takes place in countries that obey them, they show no reaction. Despite all this cruelty and oppression, they claim to be advocates for human rights. By using this false claim, they intimidate independent countries. Today is one of the most shameful periods of modern history in terms of oppression and arrogance. The people of the world are witnessing these acts of oppression and double standards. This speech was delivered to live and was broadcast via state television on March 21st this year on the occasion of the Iranian holiday of Nowruz, New Year, which is significant because of the coverage. The statements are dominated by negative portrayals of the broadly understood West. And quotation, it must be remembered that the West will never make Ukraine completely independent in the military sense providing military assistance, whatever in terms of finance, equipment, or training. Although the US supports Ukraine, the war is essentially a confrontation between Russia and the USA, where Ukraine has become only a victim. In addition to aid, Ukraine needs active support for diplomacy around the world, such as the US has with NATO. In this perspective, Ukraine is not perceived as a unique territory but only as another space for the global struggle of two powers for influence in the world. This scheme of confrontation between Russia, Iran and the West was developed during the Cold War and is grounded in the consciousness of both Russian and Iranian societies, which provides leaders with rather great public support for their actions. Among the themes appearing in Ayatollah Khamenei's public speeches to Iranians, along with the aggressive rhetoric portraying the United States as a mafia, the second highlighted topic is Iran's role in maintaining peace in the Middle East. Uh, if about uh, Russian-Iranian relations, since uh, the year 2000, Vladimir Putin's first term in office, the Russian-Iranian strategic alliance has been primarily pragmatic. It has been conditioned by Russian-American relations. The warmer the relation between Moscow and Washington, the less support Tehran receives. Although it is worth noting that Russia in the international arena most often adopted a neutral attitude or supported Iran. The second important factor determining Russian-Iranian relations is the struggle for influence in the Central Asia. In this case, Iran is taking advantage of the opportunities offered by the weakening of the position of the Russian Federation in the international arena and the involvement of its resources in military actions. 
By strengthening cooperation, Iran is finally striving to create conditions conducive to the development of its economic and military potential. The axis of development is created on the one hand by favorable conditions for economic cooperation with Russia, which are particularly desirable in the face of sanctions imposed on both countries, and on the other hand, by the reactivation of the agreement on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action for Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Iran diplomats towards Ukraine uh, shortly after Russia began its military operations in Ukraine, Iranian politicians made statements indicating an assessment of the event and allowing them to conclude on which side the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran's authorities are positioning themselves. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi, in a telephone conversation with Vladimir Putin, formulated an opinion that was read by the world public opinion as support for Russian military actions. He said, NATO's expansion is a serious threat to the stability and security of independent countries in various regions. He elaborated on it in a statement on Twitter. He said, security concerns about the growing and provocative trends of NATO's expansions to the east are understandable to all independent states and to those that oppose the US domination. At the same time, respect for international and humanitarian law and reliance on dialogue and diplomacy are essential to stop conflicts. Similarly, Iranian foreign ministry spokesman Sayyid Khatibzadeh, while promoting diplomatic actions as a tool to end the conflict, clearly blamed the United States and NATO for the situation. Uh, I quote, unfortunately, the provocative moves by NATO, guided by the US, led to the situation that pushed the Eurasian region to the brink of the Great Depression. From the first day of the war, Iran sees Russian uh, actions as a response to the steps taken by the USA. We believe that the reason for everything we see today is the enlargement of NATO and the ignoring of the facts about Europe, uh, said Raisi, as well as the disregard by Western countries for political and security considerations of many countries, especially Russia and the agreements that were finalized a decade ago. Hossein Amir Abdullahian, foreign minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, during a joint press conference with a Polish diplomat Zbigniew Rao stressed that diplomacy is the only way to resolve the conflict. Iran has adopted the attitude of an observer and negotiator ready to prove medical assistance and mediate in talks. Uh, the talks between Kiev and Moscow. Uh, Abdullahian said, we oppose war in Ukraine just as we have done in Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq and other places in the world. In mid-April, Amir Abdullahian expressed Iran's opposition to the war in a telephone conversation with uh, Ukrainian, uh, his Ukrainian counterpart, Dmitry Kuleva. Abdullahian also mentioned that he had twice mediated in the transmission of the message of the Ukrainian foreign minister to the Russian foreign minister. Poland has become the focus not only because of its close proximity to the theater of the war, but also as one of the elements of the Iran's strategic goal of increasing its economic potential. During the press conference, Amir Abdullahian also said that Tehran and Warsaw are in agreement on increasing cooperation in various fields, including energy, science and technology, uh, the automotive industry, medicine and students exchange. Rauf was his, for his part said promoting trade and economic relations with Iran is one of the priorities of the Poland as soon as talks in Vienna on the reactivation of the, uh, the 2015 agreement are over. At the same time, uh, Iran is holding talks with the Russian Federation and at, uh, intensifying trade and military cooperation. And conclusions. The Islamic Republic of Iran had adopted a conciliary attitude towards the Russian military intervention in Ukraine. 
It serves to create the basis for building Iran's economic security by reactivating the nuclear agreement, gaining new economic partners like Poland, and developing a positive image of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the West. In the opposition to the United States, but in a temporary alliance with the European Union. The statements of political leaders, although softened, remain consistent with the rhetoric of opposing Iran to the United States. In the perspective of security issues, this attitude should be treated as a part of strategic gain, not a real change in the ideological attitude of the Islamic Republic of Iran towards the West, including Europe. Strengthening the economic potential is a prelude to the development of the Iran's military potential and securing, firstly, the dominant position of the current political elite inside Iran, and secondly, to Iran's domination in Central Asia as the main player. At the moment, Russia does not play a significant role as a strategic partner. Iran continues its policy of pragmatic, pragmatism, taking into account the experience of past decades. The weakening of Russia is beneficial for the Iran in the perspective of geostrategy. Nevertheless, Iran needs Russia capable of standing up to the United States and thus stopping NATO's expansion in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, thank you for your attention. And as I suggested, uh, let's move uh, questions and answer to this uh, paper uh, till the end of uh, of uh, a session. And now I would like to uh, invite uh, to deliver her speech, Professor Veronika Jakubczak, the main school of fire service. Uh, professor uh, will give speech on the Trends in Critical Infrastructure, Cyber Security, Polish and Taiwanese Approach. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for introducing me. Uh, I would um, like to talk about the studies um, and the research that I conducted in 2019 um, in uh, Taiwan. And I've been working on this research in Poland um, since uh, 2016. So um, I would um, talk about the project briefly. And so the reasons and purposes for undertaking the project um, um, was with the connection to my um, um, general field of the research, which is security um, and uh, the globalization. And I find that the, the cybersecurity is one of the aspects that it's very common um, in this globalized world and is as important in Europe uh, as it is uh, in Asia. And uh, this research I took um, and I undertook in the field of uh, security science and studies of international relations um, within the area of globalization, as mentioned before, and critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. And uh, we can still, uh, despite of uh, what was uh, going on with the respect to the um, COVID-19 pandemics, we can uh, still observe the increasing globalization processes and uh, growing interconnectedness um, when it comes to countries and their critical infrastructure. So uh, this caused by the introduction or of more and more advanced uh, information technologies. And uh, I found some similarities between Taiwan and Poland, which I uh, explore, uh, which I have explored in this research. And uh, the aim um, of the research is uh, the, um, the analyze and uh, presentation of the of the um, approach towards the critical infrastructure presented by both entities meaning poland and uh, taiwan and uh, also um, uh, exploration of the nature of cyber attacks um, what kind of um, cyber attacks are taking uh, place if they're criminal, terrorist, uh, or activities related to the cyber warfare or cyber activities. 
and um, why I was uh, paying so much attention to this issue and I'm still um, focusing on cybersecurity is because uh, the, the cyber attacks might result in taking control, uh, interfering or stopping the work of critical infrastructure elements or strategic companies providing for state uh, basic functions, which uh, in result uh, can uh, end up in the stabilization or um, parallels of the country. And also other consequences uh, might result uh, from taking over strategic information uh, and that might lead to th threat um, of the core of existence of a state that is uh, under cyber attacks. And uh, today I will be talking about Poland and uh, Taiwan in order to compare their strategies with the respect to critical infrastructure cyber uh, security but uh, we can easily observe how important uh, the cyber security is uh, when we follow in the activities of uh, russia in ukraine we can see how they were attacking uh, recurrently um, um the cyber uh, uh, in a cyberspace the um, the critical infrastructure and also coming back to taiwan and poland uh, both countries have strategic documents on cybersecurity, and both uh, put a lot of effort in development of cybersecurity system by introducing procedures executing the laws training the personal and increasing uh, social awareness and uh, both uh, uh, countries are really engaged uh, in uh, um, their efforts and uh, this is uh, very much uh, needed because of the raising um, complexity of the cyber attacks and uh, general inter interconnectivity between uh, both the countries uh, in general uh, on a reg regional and global level as well as the infrastructures and uh, the relevance of the research uh, that would be a com that was a comparative work um, uh, and it was aimed at uh, obtaining synergy and um, how the synergy will be obtained if we if the country would uh, like to implement the outcome of the research and the recommendations is that i think that uh, both of the countries have uh, big brothers and uh, in case of poland it's um, russia in case of taiwan is uh, mainland china and uh, both countries are exposed uh, to many attacks uh, including the attacks against the critical infrastructure so if we analyze uh, what are the ways of addressing this problem we can see if uh, the lessons learned by taiwanese um, can be used in poland and uh, vice versa and uh, the hypothesis is security policy towards uh, security pol policy trends in Taiwan and Poland are going in a good direction, facilitating protection of the critical infrastructure. The initial questions for the research: What are the main obstacles, opportunities brought brought by the development of the cyberspace in Taiwan and Poland? What are the main cyber threats for critical infrastructure? how is taiwan and poland approaching the cyber threats what are the solutions presented in legal cybersecurity regulations in both countries what would be the most efficient approach towards cyberspace to meet to meet needs of security for critical infrastructure um, in taiwan and in poland what can poland and taiwan learn from each other and other countries when it comes uh, to uh, security and um, security in a cyberspace and securing and securing the uh, critical infrastructure so uh, because of the brief nature of this uh, expose i would like to mention the most important aspects um, so with the respect to taiwan 
the government faces approximately 5 million cyber attacks daily. This is the data from 2001. The examples of uh, the cyber attacks, uh, for instance, in 2018, there was a cyber attack on, uh, Taiwan, uh, on Taipei Department of Health that resulted in theft of almost uh, 3 million uh, of data of uh, almost 3 million residents um, of uh, Taipei. And there were also several attacks uh, on a semiconductor manufacturer company because Taiwan is a very important player in the market of uh, semiconductors. And um, since um, there, is, there are so many attacks, uh, the Taiwan has uh, decided early on the beginning of year uh, 2000 uh, to um, get involved in cybersecurity and um, the National Information and uh, Communication Security Task Force was introduced in uh, 2001 in January as a body to, that is responsible for developing national cybersecurity policies and uh, creating report and response mechanism, providing consultations and advice for major projects, promoting cross-agency coordination and supervising cybersecurity affairs. Uh, there are other uh, bodies um, um, like the National Center for Cybersecurity Technology and um, I would just briefly mention them. I would like to invite you to the lecture of the publication that will um, follow this uh, short presentation. Uh, there is also another um, body that is called Taiwan Computer Emergency Response Team Coordination Center. And um, Taiwan has been updating their a national cybersecurity pro program uh, every few years and the latest um, this kind of document was introduced in 2021 and we can uh, just summarize that since 2001 the solution have been introduced to improve the level of cybersecurity in uh, critical infrastructure protection in this aspect and currently we are, um, I mean, Taiwan is executing the sixth phase of cybersecurity improvement and the vision is to build Taiwan safe and uh, resist, uh, resistant and resilient with the respect to these um, attacks. There are also several cases of uh, legal regulation like Cybersecurity Management Act uh, where Mm, there is a definition of uh, cybersecurity, um, and uh, Taiwanese understand cybersecurity as an effort to prevent information and communication system on information from being unauthorized, uh, accessed, used, controlled, uh, disclosed, damaged, uh, altered, or destructed. Um, and uh, other uh, kinds of infringements uh, are also considered um, as the aim of uh, cybersecurity activities in order to reach uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information uh, and systems. And uh, also, the same uh, Cybersecurity Management Act uh, contains the definition of critical infrastructure that uh, is um, understood as an asset system or network either physical or virtual once uh, discontinued from operation or becoming less effective would lead to significant negative impact upon the national security public interests living standard of citizen and uh, economic activities mm, so those are the most uh, important uh, definitions and when it comes to Poland we also have um, several um, re legal regulations and the whole system that is aimed at uh, providing um, a decent level of cybersecurity and um, in the national framework of cybersecurity policy of the Republic of Poland for 2017-2022 
uh, we have a goal of ensuring high level of uh, security of public and private sectors as well as citizens in the process of the provision um, or use of essential services uh, and dig uh, digital services. Um, and then uh, we have uh, several special objectives uh, that I would further elaborate in my article or the book chapter. And uh, in the act of the national cybersecurity system, um, we have a definition of cybersecurity and um, the resistance of information system to, to activities that, uh, that violate the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and authenticity of processed data or related services offered by those systems. And um, then we have an act of crisis management that is um, um, given us the definition of critical infrastructure. So we understand, uh, we understand it as a systems and uh, mutually bound functional objectives, including uh, constructions, facilities, installations and services of key importance to the security of the state and citizens, as well as the serving to ensure efficient functioning of public administration, bodies, institutions and enterprises. And uh, we have also in this um, Legal Act, we have listed 11 kind of critical infrastructure elements. And it's also worth to be mentioned that uh, in Poland, um, uh, NASC, uh, which is a research and academic institute for, com for computer network uh, that provides modern uh, information uh, technology solution for information communication uh, technology solution for the published business, the government and uh, academia. And um, this uh, entity is involved in providing uh, the, um, the cybersecurity among others. And uh, we also have a cybersecurity strategy for 2019-2024. Uh, this uh, I could uh, elaborate on for a long time. Uh, there, there are five um, objectives of the strategy. Um, basically, mm, we also are facing many security attacks, maybe not as, not as many as five millions uh, a day, uh, but uh, like uh, Taiwan. Uh, um, but uh, still we have a lot of uh, cyber attacks and this is increasing and um, we should uh, really address this. And the conclusion of the research is uh, that um, um, both Taiwan and Poland are aware of importance of cybersecurity provision for the critical infrastructure. Still, uh, Taiwan has a higher level of preparedness and uh, due to the fact that human factor is always the source of the biggest threats, it is crucial to keep up a training of officials involved in operational activities and protection of critical infrastructure and uh, initiatives aimed at increasing general awareness of the all citizens are very effective. Uh, so, for instance, we have like yearly Cybersecurity Day in Taiwan and the Cyber Festival, European Month of Cybersecurity in Poland. And um, there are different uh, examples of cooperation on the international level. And uh, Taiwan experiences can be used in Poland and Polish experiences can be used in Taiwan. Our critical infrastructures might be different um, with the respect to the type of construction, type of power plants, and uh, uh, we can have a different type of threats. For instance, uh, there are regular earthquakes and typhoons in Taiwan, uh, but still we are um, countries that have big brothers, um, very much interested in the stabilization of uh, situation in Poland and Taiwan. That's why um, it's a good idea to um, exchange the good practices. And um, 
I think that would be it uh, because I would like to uh, finish my um, expose in a timely manner. Thank you so much and I invite you to ask me questions since I have to be going in 30 minutes and uh, Professor uh, uh, Abbasi agreed to do this adjustment. Uh, thank you very much for delivering this speech. And uh, as we discussed beforehand, you are not able to stay with us till the end of the panel. So I invite all of you to ask questions to Professor Yakubchuk. Okay, uh, Professor Paulina Rogozievska, you're welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm just a PhD candidate, but uh, thank you. Um, uh, my question is because I was wondering, you were comparing uh, Poland and uh, Taiwan. Maybe I'll show my face, it will be better to talk with a face. Um, uh, when I think about security, cybersecurity in Europe, I actually think about Estonia. So uh, it's in the European Union and other uh, groups in Europe. So obviously Poland is um, working together with Estonia, but uh, is uh, the Estonian uh, experience on cybersecurity and Taiwanese uh, experience also similar to the Polish one? I would say that um, Estonia is quite different because it's considered the attack took place in 2007 and it, it's considered as the first example of the cyber warfare. So uh, with the respect to like Poland and um, and uh, Taiwan, we are talking more about uh, cyber activities like hybrid activities. So and the difference between activities and a warfare we, in language of uh, security studies experts, is that uh, the activities are the part of warfare, uh, but they also can uh, be uh, taking place uh, before the war is happening, right? So, uh, so this is uh, like, um, of course, uh, officially, the attack uh, upon Estonia, where it was uh, like the government pages didn't work for over 20 years. I think it was almost a month when they have problems with the with the not only the government um, pages, but also the banking system. And it was uh, an attack led uh, by the hackers from Russia, which was later proven and backed up by the so-called so um, patriotic hackers, uh, the, meaning that uh, Russians, uh, Russian professional hackers that were um, associated with uh, Russia also made um, special web pages where even a rookie, somebody that is not a hacker, can access and use their computer as a tool to attack uh, Estonia. So coming back uh, to, and so this is the nature of the attack in Estonia, whereas the attacks in Poland or in Taiwan, they are not uh, that uh, obvious. Uh, it's a more like uh, the, the scale is big, but because for in, especially in Taiwan, but because of their level of preparedness and ability to react or even um, do everything uh, for the attacks and not to have any uh, results upon like uh, everyday person. Uh, then we can tell that the nature of this attack is totally different to, to what Estonia is happening. I used to live in Taiwan in 2012 and 2019, and I uh, was using the, um, the governmental pages, uh, both for the private and, uh, and the research, uh, private as, as, uh, as, some, as somebody that used to live, that, that was living there at that time, and uh, for the research purposes, and I never really seen anything, um, any like major problems that would last for such a long time. So uh, even if somebody would say that this is a war, 
this is like a cyber warfare i would say that um that the nature is different and in my personal opinion uh, resulting from my uh research it's more like activities than than the warfare um but uh, maybe it's also because i'm influenced uh, by the by the media that is uh, present in in taiwan because they they are not agreeing with mainland china with the people's republic of china but they also avoiding the the like total the frontal like uh, the confrontation and uh, when it comes to poland uh, you can see that we have like um, a lot of attacks but it uh, hasn't happened that uh, like our web pages were down except maybe for this one accident when the uh, when the physical uh, cyber uh, in infrastructure was burned in warsaw uh, under the wajankowski most and uh, it hasn't been officially admitted that it was some kind of attack uh, it was not like cyber attack it was more like uh, if it was an attack <laughs> because it was not confirmed but Many times we don't know what is uh, like uh, um, a warfare activity, what is an attack, because we've been been protected, you know, by our special forces and our governments from understanding what is going on. But um, so we have never really experienced such a such a attack like Estonia did in 2007 but still uh, like what's going on just turn on TV and uh, all this information that's been stolen from the officials uh, emails uh, how it's been played you know in the psychological warfare how uh, um, we still have uh, like uh, the um, the higher level of um, um preparedness right now uh because we are right now our experts the um in the security uh, area are um, um are uh, ready for the cyber attack any moment because of what's going on in uh, ukraine thank you very much thank you uh, is there anybody who would like to ask a question to Professor Yukupchak? Okay, thank you very much again for the speech and okay. for the answer. And now I would like to invite uh, to take the floor uh, Dr. Jan Nagusik from Jagiellonian University. Uh, the topic of the speech is changes in Japan's immigration policy of 219 in the context of demographic crisis and perception of foreign workforce. You are welcome. Um, good morning, uh, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, so first of all, I have a question. Is my presentation visible? Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, as my name is Jan Nagujic, and I am uh, from the Gilan University, from the Institute of the Middle and Far uh, East. And uh, my presentation today will be about policy, about uh, immigration policy. I would like to say, um, I would like to um, prove during my presentation that though Japanese is, um, has been considered as a homogeneous society, um, Japan has got uh, an immigration policy and uh, Japan even invites foreigners to work in Japan, though officially Japan does not have an immigration policy. Uh, it's complicated in uh, the Japanese uh, context. So agenda. First, survey tsunami. Uh, I would like to tell, say a few words about demographic crisis in Japan. Uh, I would like uh, the second part of my presentation will be non-existent immigration policy. So I'm going to prove you that Japan already has got immigration policy. So it's been pretending for the domestic purposes that it hasn't got. And I would like to show the, I guess, the faster part of my presentation will be on the attitudes of uh, the Japanese politicians, activists, 
uh, and uh, the society towards uh, sort of immigration and immigrants in general. And also, I would like to show you some cases of um, treating uh, immigrants in uh, Japan. So first, silver tsunami, what is that? Um, actually, population of Japan in 2020, I'm going to show you the newest uh, but checked um, uh, data. Uh, it is um, it is published by uh, the Japanese uh, year the, the yearbook of the Japan or by Japanese handbook, which is uh, uh, published by uh, the uh, internal Ministry of Internal Affairs, and uh, this data has been confirmed. So uh, in twenty twenty there were about more than 20, 126 million uh, Japanese people. The total the fertility rate it means uh, how many children. Uh, each woman has during her lifespan is 1.36. So it is not enough uh, to uh, maintain the living standards and uh, to maintain the replacement um, rate of the society. Because in order to replace, to maintain the replacement rate, you need more than two children per woman in her lifespan. So also we have life expectancies in Japan, which are one of the longest in the world. For a woman, it is more than 87 years so if a child a girl is being born right now probably she was she's going to live more than 87 years on average and the man is more than 81 years so it is very long and japan is called uh actually it is in a phase of hyper aged society it means that more than 21.1 percent of the society uh is um older than uh, is more it is 80, sorry, uh, 65 or more years old. So uh, actually Japan has been in this space since uh, 2007. And to show you, um, to show you the, um, how big this problem is and uh, that Japan has been leading actually in the ranking of uh, the oldest societies. Uh, I prepared this rank from um, OECD uh, and United Nations organizations uh, uh, charts. And this is a rank of top five um, oldest societies that we may say. So this is where uh, the, there's uh, countries with the largest percent of um, people who are 65 and older. Why 65 and older? Uh, because according to, uh, to the uh, definition, uh, these people usually retire and they uh, stop paying taxes um, that much and they don't spend that much money according to statistics. And um, they start being dependent on the working group in the society, which in Japan is from 15 through 64 uh, years old. So anyway, Japan is uh, number one. And uh, yes, uh, you, may, you will find that more than 28% of the Japanese society is 65 or more years old. Uh, the second is Italy, third Finland, Portugal is fourth, and Greece is the fifth. So you will, you will see uh, mainly European Union uh, countries. So uh, we have to be aware of the problem, which is also waiting, awaiting our uh, European Union. Population of Japan in the future. It's going to shrink. It's been shrinking since 2007, actually. And um, right now, the Japanese politicians say that something should be done with the crisis, uh, with this demographic crisis. And uh, according to uh, estimations, rough and um, the middle um, way estimations, because you can um, put pessimistic and very optimistic estimation, this is the middle way. Uh, estimations, uh, probably in 2050, there will be 90 million uh, Japanese people. Right now, once again, it is about 126. And at the end of the century, there will be probably 40 million Japanese. Um, yes, it's, it's a shocking drop in numbers. People aged from 50 through 64 in 2050 would be about 40 million people from today's 80 million. So this is the group that keeps working and keeps paying taxes and actually uh, spending um, their money and uh, actually being the most important for the economy. And um, this is called silver tsunami, actually. A silver tsunami, which is right now going through Japan. It started some years ago and it's been sweeping its economy and uh, the Japanese government and also the society have to adjust to it. 
what do they do? They also they create a civil politics. So they, uh, the leading party, which is uh, since uh, right now 2012, um, Liberal Democratic Party, uh, they introduced uh, a special policy uh, to um, help uh, seniors uh, in their society. Uh, they have to adjust, of course, uh, their policy. Uh, also, they have to uh, take care of them uh, uh, and uh, give more uh, or give away uh, more uh, medicine, which is for free for those who are 75 years old and so on, so on. So anyway, they have to adjust uh, also uh, their politics uh, for this um, uh, silver group of people. And a silver tsunami uh, is, is very costly uh, and uh, the, the Japanese society has to do something about the lacking in the workforce. That's the main problem. It's not the problem is that the society has been aging, but uh, how it influences its economy. So uh, the idea is to have uh, some immigration policy. Um, but the one problem is that the Japanese society after World War II created to create it um, um, interesting from the research point of view policy that they are homogeneous. It means that the Japanese have the same genes, the same blood, uh, the same culture, and that's why they cooperate so well. Uh, that's why their economy uh, was uh, flourishing in the 60s, 70s, and in the 80s, until the, the beginning of the 1990s when they uh, had a huge crisis. Anyway, uh, this, um, uh, this opinion about homogeneous society has been prevailing, especially among the older generations. So it is also a problem. How to create an immigration policy pretending that you don't have an immigration policy? So this is what uh, actually has been uh, done uh, by the um, Liber Liberal Democratic Party and um, uh, former uh, Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe. So I'd like to show you uh, what, uh, what were the rules, um, um, the immigrational rules until 2018, uh, when uh, Shinzo Abe was still uh, governing uh, Japan. So first of all, um, there were two kinds of, sorry, there were five categories of visas. Uh, people with special knowledge and skills, and uh, that included professors, lawyers, for example. The second category was people staying in Japan on strength of their legal position, such as of those of Japanese descent, permanent foreign residents, and those with Japanese spouses. And uh, that is um, considered to be a huge group because of the Chinese and Korean minorities. Uh, most of very vast majority of people from these minority groups are uh, descendants of um, immigrants uh, to Japan who came uh, during uh, the Japanese empire, so until 1945. Trainees under the technical intern training program, which is very controversial, it was started in 1993. And uh, this uh, trainees, uh, this technical intern uh, training program um, is um, very controversial because uh, it happens that uh, trainees are taking away their passports and uh, they have to work almost uh, uh, with no uh, um, with no wages and uh, so happens in japan that um, uh, they are treated almost as slaves there these cases uh, have been very uh, loudly discussed uh, in uh, recent few years and uh, the government has been trying to do something about it in order to treat trainees um, as um, potential workers uh, in, in Japan. So it is very controversial, but still it is, uh, uh, it is valid. Um, people engage in specifically designated types of work for which wages are paid. And these are, uh, this includes nurses and care workers. Japan has been aging and they are in constant need for nurses and care workers. They don't have enough, literally, they don't have enough hands to work. So they are uh, created a very interesting programs, for example, for, uh, for the Filipinos, uh, for people from, um, from um, Thailand, for example, 
and uh, they study uh, Japanese in their motherlands. Uh, of course, they are nurses and care, uh, care workers. They take an exam, they sit an exam in Japanese, and if they pass uh, the basic level of Japanese, they're introduced, uh, they're invited uh, and introduced uh, to the Japanese working system, and they're asked to stay longer in Japan in order to uh, be included in, in the Japanese workforce. And so, yes, it is, uh, uh, we can't say that Japan doesn't have an immigration policy. Yes, they do, and they invite even foreign workers. They've been doing that uh, for some decades. And people engage in activities outside their visa status. For example, foreign students uh, are working part-time uh, in Japan, but they cannot work longer than, of course, officially, they cannot work longer a week uh, than uh, 28 uh, hours. And um, in December 2018, uh, Japan introduced a new law and it came into force in April 2019. It changed uh, a bit. Uh, they added two categories of visas, foreign workers having a certain level of skills. They can stay in Japan for up to five years, but will not be allowed to bring their family members. Uh, there's a uh, hook. There's um, something uh, which is striking in this uh, in the first category of uh, new category of visa. It means that somehow. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party was a bit afraid to uh, encourage uh, immigrants who'd like to work in Japan to bring their spouses, their families with them. It means that probably they're a bit afraid of uh, losing support in aging society. And the second category of visa is workers with a high level of skills who will uh, be allowed to bring their spouses and children. If certain conditions are met, they could be permitted to live in Japan indefinitely. And this new, uh, uh, on the basis of this new, uh, poli this new policy, Justice Ministry Immigration Bureau was upgraded into Immigration Service Agency. So their status is more important. Also, Japanese national government worked out a comprehensive policy to accept talent from abroad and ease their transition into Japanese society. And uh, the Japanese government set up local centers that offer multilingual referral services to foreign residents. And they established about 180 of them uh, so far. So it's quite a lot. And it shows that Japan, that Tokyo, uh, has been trying to improve its immigration policy. Uh, just to remind you, officially, they do not have any immigration policy. Results. What are the results of this uh, very important uh, from uh, the Japanese workforce and economy uh, uh, new law? And they wanted to attract about 340,000 people to on year, yearly, um, sorry, uh, within uh, five years to work uh, in, in Japan. And, but they did not succeed. Uh, why? Uh, because of many reasons. The first, of course, COVID-19, that was the first reason. And the second reason, Japan is uh, not that um, attractive as uh, Tokyo thought. For example, uh, the language barrier, uh, the Japanese language is uh, among top difficult, most difficult languages in the world. Um, uh, this um, perception that the Japanese society is homogeneous. I have to tell you that I've been to Japan many times, but I spent most of my time, most of my time in Kobe. Kobe it is a, a port, uh, which is, uh, I would say that it is uh, multicultural and they are very open to foreigners and they want to speak, they practice English and uh, they speak English very well. Um, people who are, uh, um, older and uh, younger, they're not afraid. But it's not the case in every part of Japan. Anyway, um, still this uh, perception of uh, Japan as a homogeneous society is prevailing and uh, this discourages uh, some immigrants to come to Japan. What do we know that as of late of 2020, uh, 1.72 million foreign workers out of total population uh, of almost 126 million uh, was staying in, in Japan. And it means that foreign national, uh, foreign nationals, uh, nationals um, are 2.5% of uh, working population. It is uh, quite a lot. And now uh, attitudes, uh, there are different attitudes, just like in every society. We have those who are pro-immigrational 
uh, those who are aware of the situation that the society is aging. And also we have those very far right wing who are totally against any foreign blood in the society. So first will be Hidena Vistakataraka, a former head of the Tokyo Regional Immigration Bureau. In the beginning of the last decade, um, he started his very uh, pro-immigrational uh, rhetoric that Japan needs lots of foreigners, lots of immigrants to work. And he said that till 2050, Japan needs 10 million immigrants to survive as a nation and 30 million immigrants to maintain current living standards. So this is um, a very positive and encouraging immigration uh, activist. And um, the second person I'm going to introduce you is Shintaro Ishihara, already late, he died last year, um, highly controversial. And uh, he said that um, since, actually, since the end of the 1990s, um, he started his uh, highly, um, ethnocentric, uh, ethnocentric uh, rhetoric that uh, some foreign groups are prone to uh, come to Japan and commit crimes. And he insisted that, for example, the Chinese, the Chinese have special genes in their blood uh, that makes them commit crimes in Japan. And because uh, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese who come to Japan are mostly illegal entrants, it means that they will definitely commit crimes. So um, this is, we have this, um, the person who represents totally different opinions to uh, Sakanaka. And um, he, uh, Shintaro Ishihara was totally uh, against any uh, immigrants uh, to uh, Japan. He also, after Fukushima accident of 2011, coined a name, um, very, uh, uh, pejorative uh, about foreigners that they, Laijin. It means that when uh, in Japan there is a problem, like with Fukushima, they escape, they fly away. It comes from two words, uh, fly uh, and uh, gaijin, which literally means an alien. So uh, he said that uh, laijin, these are, the, these are all foreigners uh, who stay in Japan. And when something happens bad, they don't stay to help, they just run away because they're afraid. And uh, I, we have to admit that uh, for many days uh, after Fukushima accident, it was not obvious what happened in there. And the Japanese government and also TEPCO did not reveal the information. They were not aware actually what happened there. And the first to say about the leak were the French, which is very interesting. And um, foreigners were even encouraged by their embassies to leave Japan. So, and it, probably one third of them, yes, they really tried to leave uh, the region of uh, Tokyo. But uh, most of uh, foreigners stayed. But Shintaro Ishihara, of course, tried to gain uh, more political supporters uh, for his uh, case. Uh, when uh, talking about attitudes, we have to also say that uh, Japan has a special multicultural policy. Uh, and I think I should be uh, uh, finishing. So just to wrap up in we're about in one minute. Uh, they have a special multicultural uh, policy, Tabunka Kyosei. Uh, it was uh, uh, started in 2006, it was revised, and they uh, tried to encourage foreigners not to be a burden for the society, but to encourage them to be uh, those who participate actively as members of the uh, society. So, uh, and uh, the last thing is the growing number of uh, foreign residents uh, in Japan. And though uh, we, we have uh, uh, COVID-19, Japan is right now finishing its seventh uh, wave of COVID. Um, there are still foreign workers and generally foreigners uh, in Japan. And um, it looks like uh, the Japanese attitude uh, towards uh, foreigners uh, has uh, uh, changed. So this is uh, all what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for inviting me and for listening. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, who is Bruno Surdel, Dr. Bruno Surdel from Center for International Relations. Uh, and uh, the topic of the speech is Ankara between Washington and Moscow. Turkey's strategic dilemmas in the backdrop of the Ukraine war. You are welcome. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yeah. Let me share my screen. 
I think I have like 15 minutes, yes? Uh, 20 minutes you have. 20 minutes, yeah. okay, I think 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, okay, and let me share the screen with you. Uh, can you see? Yes, we can. But can you see my uh, my presentation moving ahead or not? Is it okay? Um, we are seeing the program and the presentation in the program. I saw you click the presentation button, but it just showed a circle uh -huh. and then did okay, it. So, okay, so let me, sorry, I have to do like that. I hope anyway you can, you can see what I'm sharing. Can you see? So let me do like that unfortunately yes okay um so why uh um okay the topic you see of my presentation also my paper i will i will um, present to you i have such a i have had the opportunity to live five years in turkey which is a wonderful um, country i i lived there in a very nice time between 2011 2016 it also encouraged me to research more about um, Turkey. Mm, in my paper, I am, I'm using uh, offensive realism. Of course, you can see the picture of John Merzheimer, who invented that term, saying um, that actually you cannot measure uh, states' power and states, this is why states um, try to um, maximize as their power. Mm, which leads actually to their attempt to hegemonize region or even globe, as we see um, uh, now struggle between China and United States, for example, but also uh, Turkey's um, struggles in the Middle East and beyond. And here also I owe an explanation why I'm using the term um, Turkey, because it's now official English Time for from Turkey, at least it is promoted much by Turkey. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to use it agenda for my um, for my presentation uh, today. Yeah. So first we start from uh, Ankara's foreign policy before the Ukraine war. Then we look shortly on domestic situation and its policy, foreign policy ramifications, and then. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Turkey as yes, minimizing losses, maximizing gains approach. And then conclusion, will Ankara win or lose the West East confrontation or maybe both? Okay, so first, Ankara's foreign policy strategy before the Ukraine war. And um, it started actually the, the shift, the very shift of, of um, uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy with the realization what has been going on in the world, especially in East Asia, when and where China became first, second, later, uh, first, third, later, second largest economy. Uh, so, uh, both China and also Turkey, uh, they recognized the, the post-Western global order is approaching or even has been uh, born. Also, uh, over the over last 20 years, Turkey realized, same as China, yeah, that there is a relative decline of the USA um, as a global power, which is actually sealed, such an image was sealed and confirmed finally in 20. Um, in last year, uh, when in August, um, Taliban um, captured Kabul and, and what happened was a chaotic withdrawal of United States from Afghanistan. Always, and it's like a mantra, what you see here, world is bigger than five. It was kind of a mantra repeated many times every year by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan which meant actually that what he was um, hoping for was uh, uh, 
exactly strengthening of multilateralism and the reform of the United Nations Security Council, which has not happened. But there, um, the, but there is, of course, talk about that. The main factor for um, uh, a shift uh, in uh, Turkey, Turkey's foreign policy was rise of China, of course, as I told you. And it's Belgian Road Initiative, which was announced in 2013, first in Kazakhstan, later also in Indonesia by um, uh, Chairman Xi Jinping. Interestingly, a part of that was Shanghai Cooperation Organization for Turkey. Why? Because any time Turkey has had problems with European Union and just remember the frozen negotiations of the membership with the, in the European Union, Ankara was using or rather threatening or using this Trump card that uh, it will more cooperate with, uh, with EuroAsia or Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And actually, the, let's say victims of uh, that Turkey's approach was, of course, uh, the Uyghur issue, Uyghur people speaking Turkic, Turkic language and sharing with the Turks Sunni denomination of, of Islam. Uh, just, uh, okay, look at other factors, like the background on Turkish foreign policy. Uh, in the first decade of, of 2000, even, even some years later, as I uh, myself personally experienced in Turkey, was economic, um, let's say, prosperity and growth and economic self-confidence. Um, on one hand, on the other hand, um, ideology. Yes, neo-Ottomanism uh, with uh, uh, former foreign uh, minister Ahmed Davutolo writing a famous book about neo-Ottomans. We are all Neo-Ottomans, I mean law and justice. Uh, law and uh, justice and development, sorry, justice and development party in, in, in Turkey. Yeah. Another factor which actually shaped foreign policy uh, was uh, the situation when in 2015, um, Turkish uh, uh, Erdogan's party uh, actually couldn't uh, win clear majority, they needed to co-opt nationalist uh, movement party, MHP. Uh, what is worth mention is much later, but still very interesting um, influence of, of um, an ideologue which has affinities to, to proclaiming Russian ideologue, um, Eurasianist ideologue, uh, Alexander Dugin, here is Dov Perinček in Turkey, which in recent years has had some influence on Turkish foreign policy, especially with something which shaped Turkish relations uh, with Greece and Turkish claims, uh, semi official claims on Dodecanes Islands and Eastern Mediterranean, on the stage tensions we have experienced over the years of so Blue Homeland or Mavi Vatan ideology in Turkey. Um, Turkey has been um, heading uh, over the last, let's say, 15 years towards so called strategic autonomy. Yes, uh, not just in Europe, there are talks about uh, strategic autonomy towards the United States, but also Tur in Turkey. There are debates, everyday debates in the media about Turkish strategic autonomy as regards Europe and the West. Yeah, so actually it means kind of decoupling from the West, of course, ideologically, yeah, with the rise on, of Islamism in Turkey, but not from its institutions, yes, which are actually cherished. I mean, customs union with the European Union and NATO of which I will be talking later, yeah? And all these factors, they uh, led Turkey and President Erdogan to kind of unilateralism in its foreign policy. First, it was Ahmed Davutoglu's 
uh, zero problems with neighbors, but later some people say uh, zero neighbors policy. Yeah, but in real terms, it it meant actually much bigger assertiveness in Syria, um, starting from uh, 2016, so several years after after uh, the war started in Syria, the uh, civil war in 2011. Um, but of course, even earlier, um, Turkey was supporting free Syrian army, so uh, opponents of uh, President, embattled President Bashar al-Assad. In recent years, also, Turkey has been much engaged in supporting um, United Nations recognized um, government in Libya, in Tripoli, which interestingly was contested somehow by Russia. Yeah? Also, uh, on other fronts, Turkey uh, has been very assertive, it still is, in battling and fighting uh, PKK, so uh, workers, um, Kurdistan Workers Party in, in north of Iraq, yeah, but also in Syria, yes, also in Syria, as I will be um, talking about a bit later. Um, the latest developments, not the latest, but uh, like two years ago was Turkey's engagement in um, assisting Azerbaijan uh, in its struggles with Armenia. And uh, this was one of the reasons why actually uh, Azerbaijan could take, could, could capture Nagorno-Karabakh. As regards something which is most interesting for us, uh, which is um, Turkish relations with Russia, we can say that same is or similar to Chinese relations with Russia. It is nothing strategic, actually. It is instrumental, it is tactical, it is very personalized relationship between uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and President Vladimir Putin. Um, yes, as was previously, despite all the tensions between Erdogan and Trump. Yeah. Actually, Russia's assertiveness in its region and beyond, especially in Ukraine 2014, later in Syria 2015, in Libya and Caucasus, um, only strengthened, uh, but with some caveats um, and some tensions also in 2015, for example, with Russia. Yes, and what's interesting, both in Syria, uh, and in Libya, yeah, uh, there was kind of confrontation cooperation policies. Uh, without uh, Russia's, let's say, approval, uh, Turkey could not capture African uh, canton of Rojava, so north, uh, so uh, northern Syria, um, ruled by by the Kurds. Yeah. Also, without without Russian uh, cooperation with Russia with Moscow, Turkey could not uh, um, organize um, and secure Idlib. Um, that there is no intervention, actually, Russian intervention in Idlib, thanks to Turkish relationship with Russia. Yeah. And another factor. Important factor as regards Turkey, Turkey, um, Russia relations was uh, attempted coup in in in, in Turkey uh, on 15th of July 2016, where the first leader, foreign leader to to call uh, Erdogan was actually Vladimir Putin, which changed somehow attitudes and approach of Erdogan to to, to Russia and. Uh, and uh, Putin. As regards the United States, there is kind of uh, um, frenemy relationship, yes? Uh, and also, um, Fate Corp 15 July 2016 played a big role because response from the West, from Obama, but also, also from Europe, was not very satisfactory for 
uh, for Turkey and only strengthens skepticism towards the West on the part of Ankara. And um, especially when Turkey decided to buy a Russian S-400 missile system and because of that was uh, suspended or kicked off of F-35 project, uh, which actually Turkey was much engaged. Yeah. On the other hand, what was Turkey's grievances towards the United States? It was uh, American support for the Kurdish um, Syrian Democratic Forces in north of, of, of Syria, yeah, in so-called uh, Rojava, uh, which still is a bone of contention between, between the United States and Turkey. As regards Europe, uh, the, what we feel, what we see is a kind of fatigue, so disillusionment, yes, on the part of Ankara as regards Europe's policy towards Turkey and this waiting forever for its accession to the European Union, which actually maybe will never ever um, come true. I mean, this dream, it becomes actually less and less dream in Turkey. Yeah, so as I thought, what we have been observing as aftermath is a decoupling, of course, ideological, but not from the Western institutions. Um, the very powerful factor, again, I will come to that, was a failed coup of 15 July 2016. Aftermath was actually strengthening of Erdogan's power and which led actually to executive presidency and um, let's say uh, consolidation of power and, uh, and, and putting in prison thousands of people, uh, not just uh, Gulenists, which were accused of masterminding the coup, but also Kurdish activists. Yeah. Um, but one of the actually most defining and consequential, um, consequential factors was pandemic and uh, economic crisis. Yeah. Even before the Turkish economy was not in a good shape since 2016, 2017, and later it became just worse, partly because of President Erdogan's unorthodox and uh, an orthodox vision of economy, especially of um, the cause of inflation. Yes, so now anyway, there is like 60, 90% of inflation and huge problems from, from small and medium sized companies and rising unemployment, free fall of uh, Lira. Um, so uh, uh, that was a situation when uh, on 24th of, uh, uh, February this year, uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, and President Erdogan uh, sees this as a kind of window of window of opportunity, but at the same time as a huge challenge for challenge for Turkey. Uh, why? Because on the one hand, yeah, this is um, the problem is reliance on tourism and energy. Yes, 45% of natural gas comes from Russia. There's also big exchanges regards agricultural product. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, Turkey is building also Turkey's first, uh, Russia is building Turkey's first nuclear power plant at Akuyu, which is going also to manage that power plant. And also, as I mentioned, cooperation in Syria and Idlib. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, as President Erdogan said openly, Turkey, Turkey cannot give up uh, neither relations with Ukraine nor with Russia. So it's kind of balancing act, which has also the consequences for NATO and for um, the West. So Turkey condemned Russia's aggression. Of course, they did it. Yes, the Turks did it. But in the same time, it has not joined sanctions against uh, Russia and has presented itself as a mediator 
hosting Moscow Kiev talks in April without results. But what was important for Turkey was that uh, foreign, especially Western diplomats, was, were flocking to, uh, to Turkey for talks. Yeah. In the same time, uh, Turkey uh, has been supplying, not for free, of course, Ukraine with, with uh, very famous uh, Bayraktar uh, drones, which have helped much uh, Ukraine resistance against um, Russia. What are my um, conclusions? Mm. Of course, there are two basic factors. First, external factors with regards to Turkish uh, foreign policy. So, uh, Turkey as actually nobody in the world probably have expected um, consolidation of the West in the face of Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, probably some of you um, remember when 2017, I think, uh, France's uh, President Macron declared NATO's, uh, that NATO is brain bad, precisely because it couldn't uh, do much as regards to Turkish incursion in Syria. Now, we see NATO's revival and strengthening of not just Eastern flank, but of the North Atlantic alliances as such. But it comes with um, fruits uh, for Turkey, which is recognition of Turkey as a geostrategic role in the region and in the and NATO alliance is the second strongest um, army, yeah. On the other hand, there are, of course, ties with Europe and membership in Western institutions like NATO and customs union. Uh, but uh, the same value have even, even more value, have internal factors also for foreign policy of Ankara deepening economic crisis in Turkey, presidential parliamentary elections next year, yeah, which actually happened to coincide with centenary of the Republic of Turkey, yeah, which was established in 2020, sorry, uh, in, one, uh, in 1923, yeah. So um, President Erdogan must be very careful what he's doing as regards foreign policy, and rather what he has to do, he has to, uh, on the one hand, not to deepen economic crisis because of its foreign policy, but on the other hand, to show uh, his nationalist allies that Turkey is uh, independent and autonomous in uh, its foreign policy. So my conclusion is that Turkey is going to continue is rather transactional approach to the West, what we have seen now in Sweden and Finland, NATO bit, bit for membership when Turkey put some preconditions. Actually, we, we, can, we, we, don't, we don't expect a veto from, a veto from Turkey, but um, Turkey wants to strike some, let's say, deals with, uh, with Europe, with, with NATO uh, countries. Um, yes, yeah, so Turkey tries to minimize losses and maximizing, uh, maximizing gains, yeah, and building strategic autonomy, yeah, and of course, raising this in the media, raising this in, in, in public debates, it is important for, for President Erdogan to, to win elections next year, both parliamentary and presidential elections. And of course, uh, of course, um, maintaining relations with Russia and China. Yes, because all these factors, uh, President Erdogan thinks will, will strengthen uh, Turkey's position as a middle-sized power with regional and global ambitions from Balkans to Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speech. And uh, I have the pleasure to invite uh, our last speaker, uh, Mr. 
Paulina Rogoziecka, University of Łódź, History Issues of Japan in Politics and Education. You're welcome. Thank you for the introduction. I will show my uh, presentation. Yes, wait a moment. I need to. I think if I force it, it will just show up. Okay. So, yeah. Can you see my uh, screen now? I hope you can see it. Yes. 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 Uh, okay. Um. Oh, okay. So, um, like I have been introduced, my name is Paulina Rogozetska. I am a PhD student at uh, Doctoral School of Social Studies of University of Łódź, and I am also associated by my supervisor with the Cathedral of Asian Studies. Uh, today's topic is uh, history issues of Japan in politics and education and uh, it will be a short presentation. Uh, it is uh, relevant to my thesis research and uh, so I will introduce it shortly at first to show the relevant points of my research that connect with this uh, short presentation and the subsequent uh, publication that I hope to submit. Uh, then I will uh, talk a little bit about what are the history issues uh, of Japan? Uh, short uh, example uh, of these issues in the policy and uh, in education in Japan and some conclusions, uh, tentative conclusions on this matter. Uh, my thesis title is, uh, as is shown, History Politics of Japan and its Influence on Changes in Japanese History Textbooks, National and International Aspect. Uh, it's a quite a mouthful. Basically, uh, what I want to do in my thesis is to find out if what the government of Japan does as a government, the uh, politicians uh, of the governing party, which uh, is the Liberal Democratic Party, mainly uh, do say about history and the connected issues, have influence on the textbook writing and two relevant points, uh, two relevant hypotheses uh, of my research are that. Um, Japanese politics on history are not made by uh, some memorandum uh, written and uh, done uh, according to this memorandum, but uh, just uh, uh, some of reactions to other actors on the political sphere uh, on those disputed historical issues. And also the second hypothesis is that the uh, influence of those politics on history are not direct. It's not like the prime minister says, we have to talk about this issue in this way. Uh, it's more like the prime minister says his uh, point of view and the textbooks uh, according to uh, the later um, review system uh, change, um, maybe not according to what the prime minister said, but are some similarities that can be seen. Uh, that is my second hypothesis. Uh, so uh, I use uh, the term history politics. Uh, although I know that in English it is most relevant to use the, the term memory politics, uh, I prefer history because, in my opinion, uh, I believe it is um, it has broader, uh, more encompassing scope of meaning. Memory uh, is not so vast. Uh, in my research, I use the definition of uh, history politics in Polish Polityka Historyczna by uh, Rafał Chwedoruk from 2018. The main points are that the actions of different various actors that are not only state actors can influence the 
different policies and politics in order to uh, realize interests of those actors. Uh, the goals are complex. It can be uh, everything that is shown here. It can be much more. It can be just one or two goals. Uh, the main uh, important part is that history is a tool. We use history, uh, the actors use history to gain those goals to realize their interests and they use various uh, various fields to do this they use law education culture science uh, so it's a very very broad uh, definition of what history politics actually are uh, my main aim in the thesis is to uh, like i said talk about the influences on the textbook writing but also to show the uh, this history politics of Japan as a system. So uh, is it a system? How does it work? What influences what? So a bit of a, a neoclassical realism connected with a bit of constructionism and uh, some institutionalism is my uh, approach uh, from the theoretical point of view. The history issues are that I use in my uh, research are not the exhaustive lists. Uh, there are much more that can be uh, uh, put as an example of what uh, Japan uh, has as an historical issue, but the main that are according to Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, are the uh, Apologies for the World War II and the reparations and individual claims of the victims. Also, uh, in broad scope, the history in relations between China and Japan and between South Korea and Japan. And some particular issues like the uh, so called comfort woman issue, Nanjing incident issue, and uh, history textbooks, controversies or visits to uh, Yasukuni Shrine, which is a shrine that also is a place where the uh, criminals, uh, the A-class criminals from the uh, Tokyo court are enshrined. Uh, very controversial issues that has been uh, also um, That have been, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, that have been uh, controversial in the international scene that made problems for Japan uh, in the international relations. Uh, I also take into consideration other history issues that are uh, connected with World War II, but not only. Uh, I uh, want to uh, see. Uh, how the battle for Okinawa in 1945 is uh, told and written about. What is told and written about the museum associated with the Yasukuni Shrine, which is called Yushu Kan Museum, that has some controversial views on uh, history. Also, the uh, Kwantun Army, so the army of Japan that was operating in Manchuria, and the uh, unfamous uh, 731 Butai, which conducted some uh, biological research on Poles and uh, civilians. Uh, also, where do Japanese come from and where does the Japanese family comes from? Because those are also some controversial issues. They are not on the MOFA uh, list, uh, because they are in the exception of Quantum Army and 731 Butai, uh, I believe more treated like an internal issue and not international issue. Nevertheless, those are some historical issues that are quite controversial and uh, I want to do more research on them. Uh, although we don't have touch to uh, touch every single uh, question here, I will just uh, talk about two particular issues, the comfort 
Women and Nanjing Incident and the Apologies for the War, uh, which I will be uh, speaking about in the part about uh, history issues in politics. So the comfort woman issue is, I think, the most uh, widely internationally known issue, historical issue of Japan. Uh, many, many parts of this issue is uh, disputed amongst uh, the naming of the issue. Uh, I use the term that is a direct translation from Japanese, uh, but uh, the uh, scholars of uh, many different fields uh, usually uh, use the uh, name of term of sex slaves. Uh, the stance of the government is that it is not appropriate, so the uh, government consequently uses the comfort women. Uh, also, the recruitment process, I say recruitment because uh, it is also a, a wide scope of women that were those comfort women. We have Japanese women who were actually recruited in Japan and they were professional prostitutes. Um, but then we have some women from other uh, nations, from Korea, from China, from Taiwan and other nations and uh, there were cases of forceful taking or some uh, deception during the recruitment process they didn't know where they were going they were said they were going to be paid and they weren't so we have uh, also a many scholars just uh, saying that they were first were taken away but the government, Japanese government stance is that is not appropriate either. Uh, and uh, there is also the uh, lack of reparations for the uh, claims of the uh, individuals uh, that were victims of this uh, process. Uh, but the government stance is that the uh, there were reparations, there were letters signed by prime ministers, subsequent prime ministers, and the funds uh, given by uh, an organization called Asia Women's Fund. It was funded partially by the Japanese government. Uh, so the government uh, also uh, has uh, taken the stance that the issue is no longer an issue but uh, it is, uh, for uh, first of all, it garnered international attention uh, because it is a violation of women rights and the uh, NGOs, uh, especially in South Korea has been uh, making, uh, has been taking a lot of effort to uh, not let the uh, this case be forgotten. For example, uh, there were criminal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, civil cases in the Korean courts. The last one was in 2021. Uh, the uh, verdicts uh, differ uh, in the uh, times when the relations between Tokyo and Seoul are good, then the uh, the courts dismiss the cases, but if the uh, relations are not so good, then the uh, cases are uh, actually um, taken into consideration and some uh, money for the victims from the Japanese uh, government is um, taken into consideration, but uh, of course, Japan does not, uh, does not take it uh, into consideration, does not pay such money. Uh, also the Nanjing incident, uh, like we can see the aspects of most of this incident are disputed 
uh, especially uh, the naming the Japanese just call it Nanjin uh, incident Nankin Ziken, but uh, the most prevalent is uh, in the international sphere Nanjin massacre or rape of Nanjin. The government stance is, of course, that those names are not appropriate. Uh, we have uh, also a disputed number of victims. Uh, we have uh, numbers from up to 20,000 to as much as up to 340,000 victims of those incidents, this massacre. Uh, the uh, Japanese government does not take into consideration this high number. Uh, actually, they don't use numbers, but the 20,000 is a number by Japanese score. It's closer to the stance of the government than the uh, one uh, with so much higher numbers that are by Chinese scholars. So what are the history issues in uh, policy? Uh, I taken uh, three statements on World War II uh, by three subsequent uh, prime ministers on the uh, anniversaries of World War II, the Murayama statement of 1995, Koizumi speech of 2005, and Abe statement of 2015. They are each 10 years apart. And uh, basically, they seem like they were built on each other, which I mean, there are some parts that are the same, exactly the same. It's like the previous statement is citing the, uh, it's like the next statement is citing the previous one. So uh, we have literally the same uh, words all over again, the deep remorse and heartfelt apology, which is um, one of the Japanese government's arguments that they did indeed apologize when uh, there are many critics that claim they did not. This uh, deep remorse and Hereford apology is taken by Japanese government as the um, that the case has been uh, somewhat solved. Uh, but indeed, these uh, speeches are not so much in the tone of uh, remorse and apology. More, they are hopeful. They put in emphasis, for example, on the help that Japan received after World War when they uh, lost and that Japan has been since returning that aid to the other states, the states that there were victims of Japan in World War II, but also other states in other parts of the world. Uh, they uh, put importance on regional cooperation uh, about peace, Japan as a peace-loving nation. It's also a recurring theme. And uh, it is also uh, very curious for me because it puts the Japanese victims of the war, so the soldiers that died, the Japanese nationals that were displaced in the uh, former uh, colonies of Japan, uh, of the uh, then their territory, and the, uh, of course, victims of the atomic bombs uh, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they are put uh, as the same level of victims as the victims of Japanese army of the uh, war that Japan waged in the Asia. Uh, a statement by uh, Prime Minister Abe is a little bit different because uh, it starts to show that it's not just Japanese fault that Japan started the war, but also that the colonial actions uh, of Western powers were what put Japan to take that stance. Uh, on the other hand, the comfort issue women is 
uh, spoken about directly without actually naming it. It's not said comfort women, but the women who suffered under the uh, persecution of uh, Japanese army and so on and so on. Uh, there's also about a lot about uh, feelings of grief, uh, but also about shared values of freedom, democracy, and human rights, which uh, the human rights part is a new uh, part uh, in comparison to the uh, previous statement. What is important, I think, maybe curious in my opinion, is that uh, Murayama was not from the LDP party. He was a coalition party leader, uh, but uh, before that, the LDP party lost elections in 1993. In 1994, the opposition parties split and the uh, Murayama's party uh, shook hands with the uh, even now governing uh, LDP. But nonetheless, he was not from the LDP, but he started these apologies. And the subsequent government just uh, took it and uh, went with it, so to speak. And um, I have a little time uh, just to uh, say about the history issues in education. Uh, we have a lot uh, of uh, issues about the textbook authorization system and the what textbooks are given uh, the way to uh, actually be published and taught uh, in schools. Uh, some of the textbook controversies were started in, internally by uh, Japanese actors, but later resulted in international uh, disputes uh, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you today uh, was the changes it is between two uh, textbooks of the same publisher uh, published in 2006 and 2016. Uh, in 2006 we have that Japan did uh, what it did due to Western world's pressure and in 2016, it was taking example of world powers. Uh, in uh, 2006, it is also that it became one of the powers in 2016, one of the empires. The 2006 is more uh, into naming what actually Japan did, so captured, annexed, moved into fought, invaded, and became a fascist country. It is missing in 2016. It's gained interests, gaining an interest. So uh, a little bit more uh, softer touch. And to uh, just put it into uh, perspective, the 2006 textbook with the fragment of other statement of 2015. So due to the Western world's pressure, uh, Japan started to modernize. And Abe said uh, that the overwhelming supremacy in technology and ways of colonial rule surges towards China and sense of crisis draws Japan forward to achieve modernization. Uh, this um, strong words that I mentioned before against wrong course and advanced along the road of war. It is a softer approach. And 2016 also compared to the other statement, we have uh, similar things also uh, that Japan became a modernized country in just 20 years. So more about what Japan achieved and not what Japan did wrong. To sum up uh, the conclusion, uh, I think, I, I believe that the numerous history issues uh, that Japan uh, recognizes, uh, but it was not recognized just 
uh, because Japan realized those are issues, but because someone other pointed it out to them, that issues are used by various actors at opportune time for them. So history becomes a tool. Those statements uh, said by politicians and the policy uh, can somewhat, we can see somewhat correlation with contents of textbook tentatively. And I believe that research into these connections may bring uh, understanding on history politics uh, of Japan as a system. Thank you. I went a little bit over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we still have uh, plenty enough time uh, for discussion, comments, asking questions. Uh, so uh, I invite you to asking questions uh, to our participants. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay. uh, actually, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is concerning uh, Turkey. Uh, yes, I, I really uh, liked all the presentations today, but especially I'm interested in political relations. So um, for me, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, especially because of uh, the war in Ukraine seems to be very important. Um, do you think, uh, because uh, you mentioned um, that uh, uh, Turkey is trying to become a medium power or is actually, we have to admit a medium power uh, and is trying to balance its relations with um, huge powers in the world. Um, do you think, uh, of course, it is difficult to predict the future, what, uh, what, what is your personal opinion about the future of uh, relations uh, of uh, Turkey and China, because China is uh, trying to become the first army in the world until, as far as I know, 2040, uh, am I correct? is uh, developing its uh, IT and uh, it's developing its uh, uh, potential incredibly. And do you think that, uh, what do you think uh, would be uh, the uh, relations uh, between uh, China and Turkey? Uh, that's my first question. And the second question will be about uh, Japan, of course, uh, <laughs> and about the course books. Um, I also enjoyed uh, the presentation because it's also uh, a topic of my uh, interest. Um, do you think, uh, my, actually there are two little questions. First one is, do you think that um, uh, somehow, uh, thanks to the new administration in Korea and Japan, hmm, uh, do you think this, these uh, issues uh, will somehow be solved soon? And uh, so that's, uh, that's the first question. And second, it's, it's not a question actually, but it's, it's a remark that, um, uh, but it's difficult to actually access this kind of information. I have to admit that uh, my friend uh, in 2017, uh, who is a researcher in Japan said that only 30% of schools uses uh, this uh, ministry, uh, ministry uh, recognized historical school books. Uh, so not all the all the schools in Japan use them. I don't know how many right now, but it's it probably changes into the, uh, the the higher numbers, unfortunately. Uh, so um, so we have to remember that not all the schools, uh, fortunately, still use these uh, these uh, these uh, controversial, highly controversial, as you said, um, newer uh, school books. So this is just, just a remark, but I think that will be very difficult to, to, to find the information about this uh, because of LDP's uh, pressure on um, governments, uh, local governments, and they pressure schools. Everything is informal. So, uh, so anyway, the future about the relations. So thank you. Thank you very much for your kind and very interesting question, you know? that actually China is much better position than Turkey or Turkey for one simple reason, because if President Xi or Chairman Xi Jinping set the goal for its country 2049 for becoming rich, prosperous, of course, democratic, yeah, and uh, country actually most important 
most powerful country in the world. Yeah? On the other hand, and, but Turkey faces this problem next year, 100 years of the establishment of the Republic of Turkey after after Ottoman Empire collapsed. Yeah. So it, China has much more years. It is enough time in Turkey, not, and also president of Turkey, not. Also, another issue is that this um, autumn, I think in October, there will be 20th um, Congress of uh, Chinese Communist Party, and President Xi Jinping will be crowned, it will be crowned as um, a Red Emperor, let's say like that. Uh, but next year, nobody knows who's win, who will win, who's going to win the presidential parliament elections because of the um, turmoil and the meltdown of the economy in Turkey. I remember when I came to Turkey in 2011, uh, for one dollar you had to pay just 1.5 uh, uh, lira. Now it's like 15 lira. Yeah, but to answer your question, what are what is the future for China, China Turkey relations? Um, there are problems, obstacles, but also there are opportunities in here. One of the big obstacles, of course, is um, trade war, and actually not trade, not just trade war, but strategic. Uh, I would say death and life um, competition between United States and China. Yeah, this is one of the main obstacles for Turkey as regards its relations with, with China, because as I taught in my presentation, of course, there is much rhetoric, anti-Western rhetoric, and President uh, Erdogan has been um, complaining that um, unlike President Trump, it was much, much difficult for him, for President Erdogan, to, um, to talk directly to Biden, who actually Mm, refused to talk to him. Now he'll be talking because of the Ukraine war. So Ukraine war is a great opportunity for Turkey to improve its relations with the United States. And probably what they will be pressing, pre pressing for is to the establishment of Turkey to F-35 program. But of course, some adjustment of European policy as regards um, Kurdish, um, Kurdish organizations in Sweden, especially in Sweden, but also in Germany and yeah, the Netherlands. Yeah, uh, so the situation is like, is like that, that um, Turkey is a very awkward position because this Uyghur minority, 12 uh, million, some of them being imprisoned in re-education camps. Uh, in, but I think in 2008, Erdogan, no, 2000, and I don't remember exactly, it was 12 or something like that. He claimed that what's going on in China, even that time it was, he said that time uh, genocide on Uyghurs. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, actually it was a terrible statement which and the Turkey faced a huge backlash on the side part of China. Later everything changed with the law initiative, investment in Turkey from China uh, from uh, from China. So uh, this, the relations are very. Uh, calm and good relations, and I think they will continue, yes, because Turkey treats an official statement, official media statement, an official debate in Turkish TV and media, China is a um, partner and partner, promising partner for Turkey, yeah, why? Because it's going to become the first largest economy. Yeah, and America is declining, and China is growing. Of course, not Russia, but China is growing, and China is going to become the the biggest, um, the biggest, uh, let's say, power in the world. But the problem with nationalists and religious nationalists is that the suppression of Uyghur minority in in uh, in China. With Turkey population is aware of that. Those who are aware, they are very unhappy with President Erdogan's position. Yeah, so. Um, Turkey has Erdogan has somehow to uh, balance, yes. So um, this huge opportunity uh, for China and Turkey, it was perceived like that, or influenced Turkey, but there are problems, yes. So United States and its, uh, let's say, strategic competition with, with um, China, but also question of Uyghur minority which Turkish people know, and Turkish movements in Turkey know, remember.
yeah but anyway the cooperation will go we go ahead uh, and even when when but if government changes i mean for example if jhps or republican party goes finally comes to finally to power it may change because they will be much much more pro-european but um, when Erdogan in power the relations will be sometimes somehow awkward but they will uh, go ahead i think thank you thank you very much any other questions or comments so um should i answer the question for the or should we wait on the other questions for mr Sudal? Uh, no of course you you can ask uh, the question for me okay uh thank you so um i'm hopeful that the uh, new administration in korea actually uh is going to so to say maybe uh reset the relations especially on those historical issues um it seems so uh, right now that it's going in that direction but i am afraid it will not be so popular with the more right-winning korean uh, um, voters so uh, it uh, should i think be done not so uh how to say it it should not be pushed onto the Korean uh, society more on the uh, we are trying to do a reset, but we are not trying to whitewash the history between Korea and Japan. Uh, I think the Korea also has an issue with the right winning nationalism view of history, so it is a, a balancing uh, a balancing uh, act to actually not uh, anger the own Korean voters, but also not to uh, maybe uh, make too much pokes at the uh, Japanese. Uh, I am hopeful, I am hopeful. And uh, as for the remark, uh, thank you very much. I actually was not aware of it. I, I think I made uh, that uh, rookie mistake and I thought that it's if it's uh, textbook revision, from the government that the school must use it like in Poland. So you have the uh, program and you have to stick to it uh, to have your books in uh, schools. Thank you, thank you for that remark. Uh, I would make a, a huge mistake, but uh, fortunately I mostly focus on the influence on the textbooks and not the uh, influence of the textbooks on the uh, society, so to say. So uh, very, very thank you very much for the uh, for the remark. Uh, and could I ask the question uh, for you instead, uh, Doctor uh, Guzik? Uh, because um, well, I, I am after uh, Japanese studies at Toru University actually. So I have been hearing about this declining uh, uh, number of uh, Japanese people from the beginning of my studies uh, on Japan, uh, but I have never heard this term silver tsunami. Where is it from? How was it coined? Is it a Japanese term or was it some Western term? The silver tsunami. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That's an interesting question. And I have to admit that I haven't researched that. Um, I think for the first time I read uh, this uh, term silver tsunami, uh, not in a Japanese paper, but on BBC. Um, but I don't, but I, I don't read all the Japanese uh, papers and I have to admit that my Japanese is not that good uh, to be able to read everything and especially about politics. Uh, so I can't tell you 100% where it comes from, but uh, uh, but it is used uh, uh, by the definitely by the British uh, researchers and demographers, and also by right now it is even more popular to be used by the political science specialists who coined uh, silver uh, the term silver uh, politics. Um, but it's also in in the context of of Europe. But actually, silver tsunami, I don't know. 
I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do the research and get back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We learn something new every day. <laughs> Thank Excuse you. Excuse me, much. if I may say something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Yes. Please. Yeah. So, no, the whole issue of silver generation and silver tsunami actually began in, as you rightly said, in the United Kingdom, was almost in the same time in the United States. Yeah, so it says it has actually, and also a uh, silver tsunami, it's just a Western origin, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I allow myself to ask two questions. One question is to Mr. Bruno Surdal uh, about the ideology of the capping, because you said that. Uh, Turkey uh, uh, did not or has not disengaged itself from the Western institutions, but uh, to an extent declares disengagement. Is there any, I don't know, phrases, ideology, I try to compare it with Iran. What, what would be the ideology of the Catholic, in your opinion? Yeah. What I meant by decoupling, of course, it was um, kind of um, borrowing from the term used by Americans from industrial decoupling between United States <clears throat> and, and China. But what I meant actually, uh, it's also used, is, is used by the Turkish media and Turkish scholars, is that uh, for many years, yeah, especially before Erdogan and until 2002, and also later, the first decade of uh, his role, uh, apart, you know, um, there of course uh, there were uh, there were anti-West sentiments, but on the large, on the whole, there was kind of uh, identification. Uh, in the Turkish elites uh, with um, what was also interest of the West, yes. Now, yes, uh, so uh, identification with Western interest, strategic interest, like NATO interest and so on, it has been shifting and changing gradually, especially after the coup, yeah, in 20. 2016, when uh, President Erdogan recognized, and it was stated many times publicly, that actually the West uh, not just betrayed uh, Turkey or Turkey, yeah, but the West was, especially United States, was behind the coup, yeah, it was behind the coup, yeah. So we don't longer have any ideological, if, if we had had ever uh, under ideological commons, let's say. No, but as I said also, it doesn't mean that Turkey wants to decouple from a uh, European or Western institutions, because it, as we see now, as we got Finland and Sweden, you can uh, use it as leverage. Yeah. But um, decoupling, so, uh, is closely related to Turkey's or Turkish strategic autonomy. Yeah? Before it was part of NATO, yes, it was uh, during Cold War against uh, Russia or Soviet Union. Now it's no longer like that. It is also connected to Eurasianism somehow, as I mentioned in my presentation. There's a very small party, uh, negligible influence, but actually it has big influence of Turkish army, Turkish bureaucracy, which is Eurasianism. You remember from Russia, Alexander Dugin, here, though Perinchek was a leftist. Sometimes you even supported PKK, which is interesting. He was arrested by Turkish state. But in recent years, he has big influence on Turkey, on Turkish elites, later, especially in army, in military establishment. So usual Eurasianism, and Turkey, as part of Eurasia, 
and is also um, answer for your question, uh, Professor Yan Guzik. Yan, uh, maybe on the same page as China. Yeah, yeah. So Eurasian power, not mid middle uh, power, which says power, but power, global power. Turkey hopes for that. Erdogan hopes for that. Yeah. So such a power must decouple from Western interests, but using in the same time using a membership in Western institutions as a leverage to increase its influence and power in the region. Um, yes, as uh, Turkey also feels that it has been betrayed as regards as regards Greece, yes, as we remember after uh, Turkish invasion, let's say invasion intervention in 1974 in Cyprus. Until 1970, 40,000 Turkish soldiers are on the official, official yes, territory of the European Union in Northern Cyprus. But Turk, uh, NATO has been supporting Greece in its dispute with Turkey as regards um, energy resources in Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah, uh, officially by you know, uh, President Emmanuel Macron, for example, also by Germans. So um, Turkey feels that it is like um, uh, not on equal terms as regards uh, Europe is like second category member of European institutions, second category partner for Europe. So it is seeking to be recognized as equal, let's say, of course, not equal, but to take um, as a bargaining chip, yes, to work towards more cooperation with China, with Russia as a bargaining chip to get more influence in the West. Yes, if the West uh, is more um, cooperating with uh, Turkey and, and appeases Turkey, of course, the situation may change. Same is with Iran, yeah, that why have these problems? Uh, because of what the Trump did, uh, this betrayal of the, of the uh, deal with Iran. If, if the West more cooperates with Iran, Iran will less cooperate with China and Russia. To some extent, the same with Turkey, I think, I think, yes. Turkey, for many Turks, has nothing to do with Europe, be sure. For many, many Turks, has nothing to do with Europe, yeah. It's independent, it's, uh, it's, let's say, civilization per se, as Chinese civilization per se also. Turkey, yeah, Turkey, in eyes and eyes of many, of many Turks should influence Europe, yeah? But the young generation thinks differently. They want to a more integration with European as such. So I think this, um, when uh, government changes in Turkey, everything will be changed. And there will be more integration in both in ideology and all the terms rule of law with Europe, I think so. Okay, thank you very much. And my another question was to uh, Dr. Bujik. I must admit that I know nothing about Japan, but silver economics and what you said, silver tsunami, um, got me interested in the topic. And I wanted to ask you, because for most of the societies who face the problem of silver uh, age, silver economics, is the health problem. Does uh, Japan uh, have or, or um, yeah, uh, does Japan have or have developed uh, any uh, tools to face the health problem in a few years with the with uh, the silver tsunami, silver wave in Japan? Oh, thank you for this question. Um, interestingly, uh, we are all looking at uh, Japanese solutions, uh, hoping that somehow they're going to deal with them. Uh, with success, uh, they have um, the problem with uh, the, the demographic crisis in Japan is that uh, for decades they didn't see it as a crisis. They thought for many decades, um, actually, I didn't mention that, that in the 1970s, for the first time, um, women stopped having babies uh, more than two uh, during their lifespan. 
and um, in the 1970s we can see the drop in a uh, number of uh, marriages so japanese people don't want to get married and the problem is that most of children in japan are being born within marriages so only married couple have children it's not very typical for the japanese to have uh, to be a single mother and uh, having children for example in, in even in poland it is much more popular especially in the western parts according to the statistics uh yes um so uh they didn't see the problem was coming and they didn't call it even a demographic crisis they thought it would last some years but then again they will have boom in children but they did not and um, they were not preparing uh, for, for many years. They didn't do much. And all of a the sudden they realized they don't have enough hands to work. So what they do, um, um, first of all, uh, they work uh, really, uh, I think you know these, uh, these, these facts because I think it's in popular on, on, Poli in Pol on Polish media that they try to um, work um, new systems uh, of uh, um, independent cars, cars that can drive themselves without any human beings inside. For example, um, robotics. Uh, they introduced robot robots as nurses and robots that can take care of elderly people who can carry a person, elderly person who cannot walk from a bed to a bed, for example. Uh, but they cannot replace uh, human beings in, in, in many situations. Also, um, uh, in, there are some programs introducing robots as um, assistants to um, doctors, uh, general practitioners. So they take down notes and analyze, they listen to a patient and they uh, analyze what could be their illness. So they try to um, involve uh, um, really uh, cosmic technologies. Uh, uh, what else? They, of course, womanomics. So they try to encourage women to take part as a workforce. And uh, it's not that easy because of stereotypes, what a typical Japanese woman should do. She should have children and stay home. So that's the main perception, so it's a problem. But yes, womanomics, they, they encourage women to, to take more active role in, as, as, as workers. Also, uh, right now in Japan, uh, you have to read, or you, you read the retirement age is 65. But uh, for some years, there's been, uh, there's been um, internal uh, discussion if this age shouldn't be a uh, reason, like 72 or 75 years. Yeah. Uh, so, so they want to encourage um, older generation to work longer, and actually, older generation uh, works longer in Japan, and uh, quite often they spend their money. Um, they don't work uh, as as fully employed. Uh, these are quite often um, extra works, uh, half uh, half time, they're part timers, but still they work. And uh, thanks to that, they have more money, they spend more money. So they're trying to introduce these kind of uh, solutions. Uh, um, anyway, in Japan, they talk about it. The, the Japanese, not only the politicians, but uh, people are aware of the situation. And they uh, try to um, uh, work longer and um, try to do something about it. So I think it is even much more popular in discussion, popular discussion among people and politicians than in Poland. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, let me make one short comment, I think. Uh, for Japan and Japanese people, Japanese governments, whatever government, whatever administration is there, they will much more prefer robotization than uh, migration, I think so, because they will be, I think, they will not agree for large scale, even not large scale, but migration as such. They think it's a threat for their civilization for Japan's identity, identity, I think so. Yes, I definitely agree. Um, 
it's a difficult topic. That's why if it's, it's not called by uh, the politicians officially an immigration policy, they tend to say that there is no official immigration policy, but there is. And uh, uh, there is some discrimination against uh, uh, foreigners, especially those uh, who are of Korean or Chinese descendancy. Um, of course, they prefer those who have uh, a whiter color of skin. Uh, yes. um, uh, for, I, I researched uh, Korea, Iranian, by the way, Iranian minority in Japan. And uh, they said that uh, they were uh, treated by some Japanese um, as uh, um, those who, uh, that uh, there's a perception in Japan and not only in Japan, that those who have darker color of skin, they could perform only physical work and they are not that smart. And uh, there was a quite huge Iranian minority in the 1980s and in the 1990s and so they said that it happened to them that they were discriminated against. But on the other hand, they were not discriminated on the basis of their religion. So they could actually even uh, pray five times a day if they were really uh, uh, religious. So yes, um, pers I think I, I, I think somehow uh, immigration policy in Japan is a kind of still a taboo. And probably yes, more yeah. there will be more robots than immigrants. Well, you have not mentioned. Maybe I didn't catch it, but you have, you have not mentioned the question of Ukrainian migrants in Japan. Yes, uh, Japanese government accepted first like forty-five people, later maybe one hundred or two hundred. They were publicizing this, let's say, advertising, but it's just you know for PR reasons. I think something like that. Yes, to show the West we are with you, just like that. Nothing more. Uh, Japan has the lowest, uh, I think almost the lowest in the world, um, numbers of accepting asylum seekers. I think the last year they accepted about 40, 40 people, and uh, there were about three and a half thousand applications. Uh, so it is one of the lowest. And uh, so far, I think they accepted 1,000 Ukrainians. Uh, I think that's the latest number from two days ago. I, I agree, it is somewhat to some extent uh, for PR reasons. On the other hand, um, I have to say one thing, uh, that the first person in Japan to be allowed to, to do or uh, have visa, uh, and it, uh, eternal visa without any time limits, and to bring his family with him is a Chinese person. So, there are some good signs. <laughs>